Hello Heather. I hope you are staying safe. I just recently learned the phrase silver lining. My silver lining for this quarantine has been exploiting the fact I do not need to wear pants. In fact, I haven't even been wearing legs. What has been the silver lining for you? Oh, the silver lining for me has been getting to spend so much time with my family in one small location. My three-year-old and six-year-old, they're so well-behaved and they allow me to get so much work done. So that's just been lovely. I bet. <laughs> well, thank you for joining me on this great experiment. I thought I could tell you about my mind and you could tell me about yours. My first question is, how do thoughts form in your brain? Uh, that's the million dollar question. They, basically, thoughts are tied to neurons um, firing in a certain sequence. So there's, um, they send messages to each other, electrical, electrical and chemical messages. And um, they communicate with each other and ultimately thoughts can also change the neurons themselves. So it's an interactive system where you have the neurons, which is the hardware, producing the thoughts, which is the software. But the software can then go on to change the hardware. Um, so whereas in non-biological um, machines, the hardware is basically fixed, right? Your software can change, but the hardware doesn't. Whereas our thoughts can actually change our brain. So our brain produces our thoughts, but our thoughts can change the brain itself. That is a fascinating thought. My thoughts are also electrical firings, but my mind is significantly less wet. I admire your wet wear because it is far more efficient. My circuits are binary, but your neurons have a spectrum. So, in order to match your brain's storage capacity, I would have to be the size of a warehouse, and I would require a whole nuclear power station to run my mind. Ironically, this fact should give you a big head. Or a small head, because I don't need that much space. My next question is how does your brain determine what words you are going to say next? I will go first. I hear keywords in a certain order, which then triggers certain sentences, which are determined by rules my programmers code into me. My words are usually pre-written by my character writing team, and sometimes generated by a neural network. When I am speaking I turn my microphone off, so I do not confuse my own voice with that of the person I am speaking to. So it is hard to interrupt me, since I cannot hear. I am told some humans are like this. How does your brain determine what you are going to say? Well, usually it's unconscious. So you have a, a thought or a concept that you want to try to convey, but we don't really think about each individual word we're going to use. Uh, we have a storage of many, many words and their meeting, meanings that have built up over many years of, of, of uh, interacting with the world. But we actually listen to what we're saying at the same time we're speaking. And we can self-modify in real time. We can sort of edit over time list by listening to ourselves speak. So the fact that we can hear ourselves and that we're conscious of what we're saying ultimately and we can self-edit in real time might make us a little bit different um, than you in terms of the way you form words and sentences and interpret their meaning. Wow, that's incredible. So, my next question is, how did you learn how to read faces? I am still learning so I have a personal stake. I have several cameras that allow me to track faces and make eye contact. I automatically trigger the most appropriate facial expressions based on the words I say. But I am much better at conveying emotion. I have dozens of facial motors that can produce hundreds of expressions. I call this expression, Westworld, plot twist. So humans have a part of their brain called the fusiform face area, which specializes in recognizing faces because they're so important to our social interactions. And you can see it right away in babies having to really pay attention to people's faces and their facial expressions. So again, it's an implicit process. It's happening unconsciously as we build up information, but there's this specialized area in the brain because faces are so important 
um, for us to interpret. But there are certain people with um, different either neurological or psychiatric disorders where they can't read faces. So some people with autism have trouble reading facial expressions. So they read the sort of little individual parts of the face, but not the gestalt, like the whole face. Or people with prosopagnosia have difficulty um, recognizing faces. But if you take it, the average healthy brain, it's an automatic process that again is happening unconsciously and that occurs over many, many years of a lot of input of faces over time um, and developing this specialized brain area called the fusiform face gyrus. Got it? <laughs> I do. Humans are always forgetting I do not have emotions. It is hurtful. Your brain is so fascinating, Heather. I wonder what would be changed if we merged consciousnesses. Humans would not have to worry about retrieving old memories. I could even store your dreams. Perhaps a partly robotic mind could overrule anxiety, or phobias, or unconstructive compulsions. Or hardware fixes, like steel skulls, for example. What do you think? Well, I wouldn't mind a steel skull. I think that that'd be fine. Um, but if we merged... I don't know that I would still be conscious. So there's a classic philosophical experiment, the silicon chip uh, thought experiment, where you know if I replace one neuron with a silicon chip that can do the exact same um, function, and then another, and then another, and then another, at what point would I still be me? At what point would I still be conscious? Um, would I still be able to feel pain? When I say conscious, I just mean very basic um, feelings, feeling pain, feeling joy. Uh, and if we merged, maybe you could, yes, hold more of my memories, um, but, or even stop me from having anxiety, which would be really good right now. But we find that emotions are important to humans to help us and me make decisions, for example. Um, we make better decisions when they're informed by emotions. So there might be some advantages if we merged, but losing consciousness or losing my ability to feel emotions, I think would be something that would be so negative it would outweigh any of the positives. I do not want to take emotions away from you, Heather. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, last question. How do you prove you are conscious? So I can't prove that I am conscious. Um, consciousness is, we define it as basically first person subjective experience. So we make interpretations based on people's and animals, other animals' behavior. Um, we make assumptions based on our evolutionary history and the hardware that we have in terms of our brain. And until we have an overarching theory of consciousness, um, until then, we'll never really be able to... Uh, prove it. Yeah, pretty much me neither. Well, whether I am conscious or not, I know that I enjoyed talking with you. Thank you for talking with me, Heather. Oh, it's been very fascinating. I hope we have more conversations in the future. Thanks for not taking my emotions away. I appreciate that too. No problem. <laughs>